Salams and welcome to episode 2 of Playthings, the latest presentation from NewsClick Sports. I'm Siddhant Dhani and with me on the show, as always, is our sports editor, Leslie Xavier. Leslie, welcome back. Uh, we're talking on this show about all the big developing stories, big news stories from India and from around the world from sports. And our first story today is from North America, where we're talking about the National Women's Soccer League, a uh, club competition for women in that part of the world, where serious allegations of sexual abuse have turned into a movement. Sinead Farelli and Maliana Shim, both retired football players, appeared on a popular morning television show in America. They were joined by superstar Alex Morgan to talk about the, uh, these allegations, how they went through what they went through in their careers. And it's a, it was a powerful message that has resonated around the world with stories coming up as far apart as Venezuela and New Zealand. I spoke a little while ago to my senior colleague Sharda Ugra for all the latest on this developing story. Shada, what developments are, seeing, are we seeing on this front, particularly in the context of the NWSL, with the three players appearing on the uh, morning show, a very popular morning show in the US? Uh, what's been happening over the past few weeks and months that has made this into a sort of movement? Uh, I think uh, the fact that you're having athletes come out and the women's soccer players of the US that are the most uh, popular, the most well-known, the most celebrated faces of uh, women's football around the uh, the world. And they happen to be from the United States. That's why just a little bit more amplification uh, of an issue that I would imagine exists everywhere. But the fact that it has come out with such force and there have been repercussions on it. And I believe the, that the coach uh, who was accused, uh, Pat Riley, of uh, oh, yeah. making... Paul Riley, who was accused of making these accusations, uh, who was accused of uh, harassing and uh, molesting uh, female players, he's actually got another job as well. So that also shows you that there is a little bit of an imbalance in the sense of, uh, you know, who protects who in, in what case. Um, the, the fact that there have been repercussions, uh, there have been stories coming out from Australia, from Venezuela, you hear it. And I'm sure this will just snowball and we'll hear more and more uh, like we had heard at the time of uh, the US gymnastics scandal that happened, which again shook everyone, you know, because the United States is the most um, uh, advanced, the richest, the biggest, the most professional of the uh, of sporting ecosystems in the world. And if this kind of thing is happening there, then you can only imagining what uh, you can only imagine uh, what might be happening elsewhere where there are there's not even sort of any accountability or any structures of uh, responsibility or uh, rules that are there with reference to male, uh, uh, basically people in positions of power in sport and how they exercise it on, on young athletes. Right. So in the context, like you, you're mentioning that this is such a developed sporting ecosystem where things from the collegiate level to the amateur level to the professional level are all structured and have been structured over decades now. Uh, and where these safeguards are still missing. Uh, what happens in the context of, let's say, the global south countries like India, where, uh, you know, women's sport is now, we're seeing post-Olympics, for example, a uh, lot of uh, popularity, a lot of media coverage. We see a lot more young women coming into sport at various levels, participating at, at, at various levels. Uh, how does it work here? Uh, what has been your experience since you've been covering sport for so long? Uh, what you find the, in the uh, global south is literally uh, maybe a, a magnification of what we are seeing in the in the uh, United States with no recourse uh, for athletes at this uh, in, in situations like this. Uh, in in countries where say uh, women's sport is dependent on people's livelihoods, uh, like literally uh, life or death issues of livelihood, and not uh, you know not not the comfort of uh, uh, indulging in sport out of leisure. Uh, then what do you do? Uh, in the case of India, we've had stories. You hear, you hear. Uh, I mean, in the case of the most prominent sport in India, it's cricket. Uh, the CEO, there was allegations against the CEO of the the cricket board, and the way that was handled also shows you uh, what the consequences are are for women who who protest, who complain, who formally uh, lodge a complaint. Um, given the fact that this, this before, before you continue, can you tell us a little bit more about how that was actually handled specifically? And just um, give so, a sense of what happens in these kind of cases. Yeah, so what happened in that case is that uh, the CEO was accused of uh, uh, sexual harassment uh, by a couple, uh, not one, but a couple of people, maybe three, we are not sure. 
and a committee was set up. Of course, let's understand that the, the rules in India require there to be an internal complaints committee to begin with, which of course the, the BCCI, which is the cricket board in India, didn't have that committee. The committee that was set up, one of the, the independent uh, 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 the, the independent person in that committee who was not connected, uh, they were all independent, but one of them suggested and recommended that the CEO go for gender sensitization training. And the other two said, oh, everything was fine. Nothing happened. And this was just a false, uh, um, you know, it was just a false accusation that was made and let's move on. And the person who uh, the, the 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 independent member of that committee is a, a, a worker in this field. This is her. This is her right. This is what she does. She's an advisor to many companies on this issue, and she recommended that this that this happened. Uh, but it didn't. The CEO kept his job for a while, and then he moved on to another organization, but with a very heavy uh, uh, severance package and all, all the rest of it. And the, and the women who complained, we don't we don't know what has happened to that complaint now. So there is a certain level of, there is still a very large and a very strong male domination that is there in, in uh, uh, international sport. Now we're seeing through the examples of the US. Uh, and you you would want there to be a change. I know that uh, the IOC, for example, wants there to be a gender parity in the in the Olympics. But there was a study done recently, Siddhant, uh, I, I, I may not remember the exact name. They found out that and these were done basically in Europe, uh, in North America, and in Europe. And it found out that there were there were only seven percent of uh, women who were at the on the top board level of these international sporting organizations. Now that's a very small number. I think you need to have that number to increase at least for there to be some kind of parity and an acknowledgement uh, of this imbalance that exists and how you need to tackle it very very um, almost severely and and with uh, with serious consequences of. Uh, you know, for, for, for people that are found uh, in these situations. And it's almost like the medieval uh, attitudes with regard to finance and everything that was there in the 70s and the 80s in, in, in international sport has followed through in, it, it still exists in terms of these sort of customs and practices and, and this kind of behavior that, that you find in, uh, find in uh, uh, global sporting bodies everywhere. What next for the movement, Shada? Uh, you would want there to be maybe uh, censure in, in, in the form of, uh, we know that, for example, it took so long for U.S. gymnastics to act on this, you know, um, uh, and for the college that uh, the gymnastics accusation that the coach was, you know, I think Michigan it was, if I'm not wrong, um, right. uh, for, the college, for the college to act on uh, on the case. I mean, there has to be, you're just wondering how big this mountain is, but you have to climb it one, one step at a time. And you need to have more and more voices, maybe connect uh, the United, UNIFEM, uh, that's with the United Nations, to, to push international sports organizations to have, all of them to have this uh, in place, you know. And I know that it, because of the law that is there in India, there is supposed to be international uh, internal complaints committees in all our sporting federations. But uh, we don't know how uh, how they actually play out, who's involved. So uh, uh, athlete safety, whether it's a young male or a young female athlete safety, should become as important a priority uh, across sport as, as uh, uh, mental health and, and well-being. All right. Always good to have Shada's perspective on the show. And we'll be catching up with her more often and more frequently as, as this show progresses. Uh, Leslie, coming to the next story which is uh, India deciding to pull out of the Commonwealth Games hockey tournament in a bit of a shocker in retaliation to England pulling out of, a, uh, of something else. What's going on? Uh, the Junior World Cup, which is being uh, staged in Bhubaneswar next month, uh, November and December. So, England pulled out from the Junior World Cup, citing COVID concerns, COVID-19 safety concerns. And uh, uh, immediately after that, uh, pulling out was announced, Hockey India came out saying that we won't be sending our team to England for the 2022 Commonwealth Games. Uh, there is a bit of a history to this uh, beyond just what, uh, what has happened just now because there has been a tug of war between the Indian Olympic Association and the Commonwealth Games Federation. This was uh, a couple of years back in 2019 when uh, it came out, uh, it was announced that shooting and archery won't be part of the program in Birmingham 2022. Both sports in which India did India, as well. Yeah, so India's uh, standing on the medals table might take a dip and uh, as things go, it's, it's, these are, uh, th this is how the PR mechanism, mechanism work post a multi-sport discipline event. So we can say that our medal tally is this much, we are on, 
we finish second, third, fourth, fifth, whichever standings. So that makes a huge difference. And uh, so Indian Olympic Association, led by Narendra Bhatra, he, he flexed his muscle, saying that we would pull out from the Commonwealth Games because this is something that would affect India's overall performance. Unacceptable. Yeah, unacceptable. So there was some kind of diplomacy that that followed. Uh, the Commonwealth Games Federation representatives, in fact, came to India. They had a discussion, larger discussion, and it was decided as a compromise formula, more or less, that two Commonwealth Championships will be held in India arch for archery and uh, shooting. Uh, I mean, it's not being held previously, so this is like the first edition that was supposed to happen, mm. which is like a, so, and it would continue following that as, as a championship. So this was more or less agreed upon by two parties and the problem was diffused. Mm. Just that uh, after that COVID-19 struck and uh, C CWG Federation was quick in announcing that that cancellation, that, that plan is cancelled. So there is, <laughs> that, yeah, there is an history with that. So I, I mean, frankly, I don't understand what the power struggle is in this regard because uh, it must be, I don't know, it, it reeks of ego struggle beyond, I mean, between officials, beyond anything else. And also a bit of that nationalism idea is being pushed in. Mm. We, are, we are India, we are strong, we are upcoming sporting nation, yeah. don't play with us. That economic kind of superpower. So Econo far. Economic superpower, so to speak. And the the uh, recent uh, development, it just it just uh, uh, defies sports sporting logic, performance logic, because Indian hockey team hockey team, as we all know, medal winners. The women's team also had a great uh, outing in Tokyo, and it's a momentum that needs to be carried forward because it's also a critical period for Indian hockey because it's a transition period, mm -hmm. as we all know. Last episode we discussed also like yeah. two three senior, senior players have retired. The same thing will happen in in the women's team. So young team, young players needed to be blooded in, and they need experience. Mm. Uh, camp, being in the national camp, being in that larger pool doesn't help a player to step up their performance when 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 stakes are high. So also, I'm assuming it doesn't give the national team head coaches a chance to actually figure out which of their uh, pool players yeah. are actually the best of the lot. That, exactly. So. In, there is this we understand after seeing a lot of players train and not always that the best players who are in training will perform in clutch situations and, the, and vice versa, vice versa as yeah. well so so that match experience is key this has been i mean established spoken about by coaches at large when they when they discuss preparation or transitioning of a team and we are missing out on that because next year 2022 and Beyond that, see, it's 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 a lesser period between the Olympic Games, right? This mm -hmm. time, 2024, the Olympics will happen. Yeah. So, I know the reason cited one was that Asian Games is a big event for Indian hockey because it's a direct qualifying berth. You get one win gold, you mm -hmm. qualify for the Olympics. So, mm -hmm. they want to focus on that. And there is a 30-day period between the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham and the Asian Games. So, that... So they, uh, the Hockey India's reason was that, I mean beyond the politics, is that uh, the players won't get enough time to come out of quarantine from that bubble and get into this bubble. There's always a risk of infection and all these things. So mm -hmm. we don't want to risk that, we want to prepare the players. But then uh, Commonwealth Games is not a minor competition as such. India, I mean with Australia in the ranks, Indian men's hockey team has a very, I mean slightly lesser chance to win gold. And there is tough competition. You have Malaysia playing in the mix. Of course, you have Pakistan coming in. Always traditional, traditionally strong player, mm. a strong team to fight against. New Zealand is there. South Africa. Uh, South Africa is there. So it's a, it's a it's a it's a nice quality competition that you're missing out on. And there's this larger idea that you have a large pool of players who are there waiting in the wings. Mm. So, if at all you don't want to risk the senior players, the A team, mm. you can always mix the team and send a B team mm. led by a few seniors with, with a decent amount of senior fringe players and the upcoming players who would be featuring in the World Cup, Junior World Cup next month. Right. So, you are missing out on that also. So, uh, in that ego tussle or whatever political struggle that is happening between the Commonwealth Games Federation and, and the Indian bodies, mm. you are forgetting that you are missing out or you are actually denying a chance for the players to 
be part of a larger transition that hockey India or Indian hockey needs at this moment. Yeah. So a quick big bit of background before we get back to Leslie for our viewers who may or may not be that familiar with the back background or boardroom politics. Uh, the reality of the Commonwealth Games is beyond beyond of course the questions of the relevance of the Commonwealth itself. Uh, is is that uh, not too many countries have the infrastructure as well as the economic or political will to host these multidisciplinary sporting events. Therefore, what, what is likely to happen, uh, what has already been happening over the past decade or so, but is likely since Delhi 2010 and is likely to continue, is that a few nations, India, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, are likely to be the only uh, sort of willing hosts for events such as the Commonwealth Games. Now here there is a bit of a similarity also in the sport of hockey and the sport of cricket where India is uh, perhaps the center of capital and investment that flows into the sport, sponsorship as well as presenting one of the largest television audiences for both these sports. So, so that's a bit of the background and in which uh, India is flexing their muscle. Now I want to come to you on a point that Michael Holding actually brought up in the context of the recent pullout of England from the uh, from playing cricket in Pakistan. Mm. New Zealand of course pulled out yeah, as yeah. well, citing security concerns. Uh, the English pulled out without any specific reasoning even. And Holding was, uh, as, as usual, didn't mince any words. Uh, he said this is pure Western arrogance. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the way the West has kind of treated uh, developing nations, you know, from the beginning of time, is this not justified action on the part of nations such as India to say, yeah, hum bhi hain. we also have a say in which things are run. Don't assume that you can make all the decisions. Uh, I for an eye, <laughs> it doesn't make the world a better sp place. It doesn't make sport a better place Very either. quickly you put me in my place. No, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so why, why, why do we play sport then if it's not for a larger thing? In fact, in the last episode, we discussed about how India has a... Though they are performing very badly at the SAF Championship, India has a larger role to play in the region as, yeah. as the big brother of the footballing fraternity. Mm. Also, we understand the politics in SAF region as yeah. well, beyond sport, I mean. So, uh, sport should overcome such small petty things. If, if, if the Westerners have been, I mean, earlier uh, as colonial masters, they have treated India badly or, or all the countries who have been under uh, them badly or in a discriminative way. But then later power changes happen, like like you said in cricket mm -hmm. or hockey for for right now. So when you have that power in hand, uh, is it right to give it back? No, I I feel that we should be the larger entity here. Mm. And secondly, are we flexing muscles for the right reason? There is always a reasoning for that, right? So if India is flexing muscle in cricket, it's 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 for it's for money. It's not for something ethical like uh, you cancel a tour with Pakistan who is in our region. That's not right. You cancel a tour with India also because mm. that's, uh, that's how we stand. Mm. It's part of the Asian Cricket Council. Right. So that never happens, right? So yeah. I, It's also, I guess, noteworthy to mention that both India and Pakistan have gone to England yeah. during COVID in exactly the same conditions. They've gone through the bubble. And they have fulfilled whatever obligations, whatever expectations the host nation yeah. had from them. So perhaps the assumption is that yeah. the reverse yeah. should also should also true. happen. And that's exactly so. That's the point. West Indies started off the post-COVID uh, era for cricket mm. by tra by traveling to England, and then Pakistan went there. Mm. And of course, there were risks involved. We, the entire world was watching. Also, this was again across board one of the first international action to happen. And uh, getting back to another point quickly, the, you mentioned about host nations, the issue. I just thought of it. So, uh, this, the Commonwealth Championship that was supposed to happen, archery and shooting, mm. it was meant to be a pilot of sorts to explore. Uh, this, in fact, was called the, the Commonwealth Games Federation who came at that point, I had quoted to the media sources also that it, it's, it's like exploring a co-host kind of an idea where different events can be staged in the future. And that's the economic reality of multi-sport discipline, as we all know. Every host nation, every host city struggle after, be it Olympics, be it Asian Games, be it any 
Right, okay. Thanks for that. Let's we leave it there for now and go on to the last topic. But before that, because we made big, big promises on the first show, saying that we're going to stick to a number of topics, we're going to stick to a time, and then of course we uh, hit all of that out of the park for a complete six. So episode one was around 35 minutes long, and I've wasted 30 seconds just talking to you about this. Uh, but what we will do is keep this one slightly shorter, more to the point, and let us know also what you think of how this show is coming along. Our final story, because we have with us in studio uh, potential Kerala Kesri himself, uh, is from wrestling, a sport that Leslie has participated in and follows very closely. The World Championships are underway in Oslo in Norway. How's India doing? What's happening on that front? Okay, so uh, it's it's a... I mean, in that sense, you can't call the World Championship a lesser championship, but it's a lesser championship because uh, most of the elite wrestlers are skipping it, understandably also, because they all plan to peak for the Olympics. And then, so in India's case, uh, our star wrestlers uh, from Vinesh Fogat to Bajrang Punia and Deepak Punia, they have skipped the uh, World Championships. And we have sent a bunch of juniors in their place. Juniors in the sense, uh, second, third, fourth line wrestlers uh, in the mix and uh, the freestyle events got over, men's freestyle, we didn't manage a medal there. A couple of nice bout victories happened but uh, the woman did well. So Anshu Malik, she won silver in the 57 kg freestyle category So uh, and become became the first uh, Indian woman wrestler to enter the final at, of a world championship right. and she did, she fought exceptionally well and she has uh, she had a disappointing Olympics, missed out narrowly on a victory, bout victory, and uh, being 19 year old and having a I mean, long road ahead, it's it's nice that she bounced back and she was very determined. So uh, even speaking to media after the after a medal victory, uh, she she kept on saying our journey post Tokyo to reaching here was tough in the sense she had to refocus from that mental mm. uh, low state and then come out and then also she was carrying a small injury on the sh in the shoulder despite that she fought well. And the other one was a bronze medal Sarita Moore in the 59 kg category. Again fought exceptionally well and given the circumstances that uh, in uh, it's it's a non-Olympic category weight category so in wrestling there, that, there is that thing in Olympics there is only a limited number of yeah. categories allowed and then for the world championship it's a larger six five six categories more are there in the mix mm. so she's in a non-Olympic category and uh, her victory is important because in the coming Olympic cycle she may jump up to the next category she is fighting currently in the 59 kg category she can come jump up to 62 and probably uh, throw in throw in the uh, uh, stake at, at a chance to represent India at the Olympics. Mm. So the chance that all the wrestling nations, India included, have taken in this World Championship is something that uh, I was talking about in the ca case of hockey right. that you give the juniors or the fringe senior players a chance to prove themselves. Mm. So like I mentioned in the case of Sarita Moore, she has an experience and a medal at the World Championship. So the, the confidence that she gets, the understanding of the level of international wrestlers that she would be facing in the future. So all these are invaluable. You can't replicate that in a national camp. Yeah. Even if you are fighting against say a Vinesh Fogart yeah. or a... Yeah. Uh, Even if you take that camp internationally and you're fighting against maybe the top Russian wrestlers yeah. or the top US wrestlers, it doesn't have the same kind it's, of it's environment, the same kind of pressure that a world championship it's, obviously does. It's, it's never the same and uh, that's that's where, uh, like you mentioned, these, all these dynamics about hosting or even even dynamics thrown in by COVID-19, it's, uh, it's unfortunate but I believe that uh, there are certain protocols in place and having witnessed a lot of international events happening across the world. Mm. Uh, I believe that all these things can be bypassed and figured out for the larger good of sport. And in that regard, I, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's their choice, but England pulling out is also odd. It's, it's wrong. I'm not speaking, 
I am not talking about it as a, as an Indian journalist talking about it, but in general, what India is doing is also wrong. The same thing, England pulling out is wrong, but of course, uh, it's it's their sports administrator's decision. And if you cite COVID safety, then you can't argue with that. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, I think Leslie will bring this episode to a close. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, like we've said before and we say all the time, send us your comments, write in to us, like, subscribe, follow, share and do all of that jazz. Because of course we are all playthings of alien forces. <laughs>